Hello, my name is Andrea Aime. I work for GeoSolutions, an international company with uh, offices in the Italy and in the US. We offer services around uh, several open source projects, three of them are we, which, of which I will talk about today, GeoServer and uh, GeoTools and, um, and GeoCache. Uh, we are strong believers in open source uh, and uh, open services. And uh, yeah, let's get uh, started with quality assurance. So first of all, some definition about quality assurance. What is it? Wikipedia says, quoting, a way of preventing mistakes and defects in products or services. I uh, trimmed away the rest. What does it mean for software? High quality design, testing, uniform code, review, and more. Um, quality assurance by hand is just hard. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of tedious work. So we should automate as much as possible of it uh, so that uh, we can spare the humans uh, the time to do the more complex tasks, which are also part of QA. So we want to automate everything that's simple. There is also a, a social effect. If we don't apply quality assur assurance of any kind to a software project, it's like uh, with the broken uh, windows uh, theory. If you see a, a building that has broken windows, you wouldn't care about breaking another one, right? It's already in ruins anyways. So if you keep, keep your house clean and tidy, then others will also be um, you know, interested in doing the same. So how do we get here into applying QA to GeoTools, GeoServer, and GeoWebCache? These are three very large Java projects. They are 20-ish 20 year old each, so very old. Uh, in the beginning, we had a few models. Each was maintained by one developer, and the QA level was very low. Yeah, it has some tests. It compiled. The test passed. Yeah, good to go. Go. Uh, over the years, the, pro the projects grew a lot. Uh, these projects thrive on maintenance and feature development contracts, so they tend to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, just because of the way they, they exist commercially. So we get more and more modules. But the problem is, the number of developers stayed more or less the same. So more develop the same developers have to deal with more and more and more code and modules, and end up uh, landing on code that they didn't write, that they, didn't, uh, that they don't have any familiarity with. So there is more and more code sharing. We also assisted to uh, open operating system polarization. At the beginning, uh, when I joined GeoServer some 17 years ago, the three operating systems, the three major operating systems, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, were more or less evenly uh, represented. But over time, we polarized towards Linux. Mac OS stayed more or less the same. Windows the developers went down a lot. And this is a problem because GeoServer and GeoTools and GeoWebCache are cross-platform applications that do run on Windows as well. But you know we don't have the people on those platforms anymore. So that's a problem that we, we will handle. Also, these projects are long-lived. They are long-lived not only on the code. They are long-lived on the people that work on them. Dedicating significant amount of time to maintenance of the projects is very taxing. You have changes in job, you have changes in your personal life. Uh, I would recommend you to have a look at this very good uh, blog post, The Few, The Tired, The Open Source Coders, uh, which talks about you know, wear and tear on the people rather than on the software. So what, what happens? That the remaining developers have to maintain stuff they did not write or are not familiar with, and they need to wear many, many hats. There are more uh, developers hired into the job, but they, they get into the, uh, into the house, let's say, from another door. Uh, as an open source developer, I started with open source, and then I found a job that made it my, my day job. My colleagues at the company, they were hired by the company to work in the open source project. They didn't choose it. Their allegiance is to the company, not to the project. They do what they're told. They typically go from ticket to ticket to ticket, from customer to customer, and do their job as they told. But they have no direct allegiance to the project, which means they will not tend to spend their own spare time maintaining the project. And that's also a problem. GitHub uh, was great 
and it was a mess at the same time. It was great because it allowed much, uh, much better code sharing, and we have this pull request a system that allows anyone, not, uh, not uh, directly involved in a project, to contribute changes. That's great, but it also invites a drive-through contribution model where people just contribute a little bit and then they poof, go away. Which means the people that remain, the maintainers, have more and more little things to, to look after. So to sum up, we have a small amount of developers doing a lot of work. Uh, they need code, code that it's easy to pick up and understand, well tested, and uh, that uh, can uh, mm, s mm, survive the test of time. Automated QA can help in this respect. Where do we start? Continuous integration. The first thing that we did was to have continuous integration. We have one server that continuously builds the code at every change, and then we know if it's any good or not. At the beginning, that was great. Uh, maybe the code works on your machine, but it doesn't work on the build server. You, you are alerted that there is a problem. Fine. Um, that worked well for a system where most of the commits, or actually all the commits, are done by core developers that would circle back into the project and fix whatever they broke in case something broke. But with co code through contributions, this started to break. So I already. Uh, Okay, another important thing, uh, it's difficult for a single developer to cover all the databases we connect to, all the NoSQL thing that we connect to, all the services that we connect to. There is a lot of integration and online testing going. That's another thing that the build server does well. So you, you commit your changes, the, the build server does all the checks in all the variety of possible cases, and you know if you broke something that, and you didn't realize that you did. And it was sending an, an email. As I said, not enough for 2020's open source. We have drive-through contribution, people get the pull request, it's merged, they're gone. It's difficult to get them back and say, hey, but you broke something in the post-GIS integration tests. Well, I don't care. <laughs> and they poof, they're gone, and we are responsible for fixing. No good. So, what do we, did we do? We moved all the integration testing, all the automated integration testing, at the front door in the GitHub pull request. GitHub Actions, they test everything. Different operating system, different databases, and so on. So, you want to get the change in, you pass all of them, or the change does not go in. And this works much, much better. We don't have to run after people. The changes go in if they are good. Now, pull requests require review. Um, we need to reduce the noise in pull request reviews because there are a few reviewers and many contributors. So this image is a, um, a metaphor of a pull request with many issues. There's uh, something in there, but it's difficult to see what's going on because uh, so there are so many potential issues superimposed. So it's difficult to tell what goes on. Yeah, I see some bugs, I see some grass, but what's, do I see everything? Probably not. So why is it problematic? Well, first of all, the user interface for pull request reviews is detailed-centered. Um, GitHub shows the diffs at the line level. So it brings me straight into the details. It's difficult to see the overall changes. You are drawn into, into detail straight. And so you are distracted by code formatting changes, stuff that shouldn't be there, and so on. And maybe you don't see the big picture, and that's a problem. Because seeing the big picture is what we human do the best. So, first problem to resolve, code formatting issue. People contributing changes that are coming from outside the project, they adopt the largest variety of possible code conventions. It's a nightmare. Somebody indents two, somebody indents four, spaces, tabs, uh, whatever. It's a mess. And they tend to reformat the code that they touch the way they like. So that hides the actual changes in, in diffs. So solution, we went for an automated code formatting, code formatter, sorry, that does only one valid representation. There is no going around it. Uh, we use Google Java format and uh, sort pom. Google Java format for the Java code, sort POM for the Maven files. There is only one way to write it. So it, we don't get a reformatting of code of any kind. 
and so the diffs are much cleaner. You get straight to, straight to the actual changes. Code formatter benefits, I picked this from the black formatter, which is actually a formatter for Python, and they say uh, black formatted reduces effort, reduced effort, uh, it's great for sharing code because it's the same for everyone, and makes you uh, focus on what matters when it comes to code changes, which is exactly what we want. Think of uh, a project that has a distributed set of people that are all providing changes. Uniformity is key to have the system work in, in the long run. Other type of noise, dead code. People write code. Uh, their first attempt doesn't work. They try something else. Maybe they change it another time. By, by the time they are the third iteration, there are at least two or three things in, in the changes which don't belong. That variables, that methods, the classes that are doing nothing. And uh, they are also noise in the code review. We want to get rid of them. So there are flat, uh, sorry, tools, static analysis tools, that are very good at finding that automatically for you. You don't have to you know, bother yourself too much. Also, if uh, a QA tool uh, finds dead code, it's a red flag for that pull request. It means that uh, the developer that produced it struggled, that they had to go through different iterations, that uh, it didn't work the first time. This situation calls for a more in-deep code review because there might be something else that the QA tools don't catch. So it's an alert for the pull request reviewer. Also noise, obvious bugs, and other uh, stuff that uh, tools can catch very easily. Division by zero, unclosed resources, improper synchronization, null pointer exceptions, whatever. The static analysis tools are very good at catching this kind of bug. Again, if there are many of these, of these it's a red flag, and again, we don't want to have to go and do uh, flow analysis in the code to figure out that yes, there is, there is an assured null pointer exception at line 15. A tool should do it for us. So what do we use? We use PMD, error prone, and spot bugs. They are three tools that either work at the byte code level or at the source code level. So because of that, they tend to catch slightly different things. And uh, um, we run them on each and every pull request. So we have a QA build that is dedicated just to static analysis of the code. Uh, and they can also be run locally. So if you don't want you know, to take the shame of uh, having your QA build failed, I mean, personally, who cares? Everybody makes mistakes. But if you really don't want to expose yourself, you can run them locally. The build gets slower, your choice. So let's go back to that metaphor. This is the initial pull request, which was a mess. Let's eliminate small and common bugs. Let's eliminate the dead code. Let's eliminate changes due to reformatting. And boom, we are left with the actual big thing that the, the automated tools cannot find easily. What is the, the big bad bear? It's a, a synchronization issue that can cause a deadlock. It's that recursion that makes the code go in stack overflow. It's the runaway data structure that makes the program go out of memory after, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks of work. That's the kind of stuff that we are better suited to find than static code analysis tools. And that's what, where we should put our effort and attention, not to the details. OK, so. Ideally, you would start adding QA at the very beginning. You start clean, you stay clean. Ideally, uh, it doesn't happen in reality. Why? Because at the beginning, you are uh, busy prototyping, creating new stuff. You don't want to bother yourself with the details. So uh, at, at the other end of the spectrum, there is GeoTools, GeoServer, and GeoCache, 20 some year of development without any QA. And we had to introduce uh, QA. So, uh, what what did we, do, did we do? Well, we moved little by little, little change by little change. First off, formatting. It took months of discussion to find the, a formatter that any everyone could tolerate. I, I'm not going to say like, tolerate. <laughs> and then we just applied mass reformat of the whole code base, all three branches that we maintain, development, stable, maintenance, done. And that was one. Then. Uh, 
uh, integration and uh, operating system test for various databases, for various operating systems. They are, have also been introduced one by one by volunteers over time and they made sure that when they introduced them, they were passing. So that's the, the tricky bit. When you introduce a QA element, you should make sure that it passes on day one of introduction. This way you can pretend that it stays that way in the long run. Then we started introducing little by little static analysis. First error prone, then spot bugs. Uh, as I said, these tools have a certain amount of overlap. Uh, they tend they all catch null pointer exceptions or division by zeros, for example. But they all have their own specialty due to the way they work. Some work uh, analyzing the source code, other work analyzing the bytecode, and they, they are being written by different groups, so they tend to target slightly different things. So we introduced the first spot, um, error prone, then spot bugs, then PMD. PMD is the one that we actually use the most in the end because it's configurable. We can create our own checks when there are none that, that fit the, the need. And um, yeah, we have been uh, growing a set of, uh, of, che of checks over time. And every time we add a check, we make sure that the whole code base is clean regarding with that check, commit and start again until we, we run out of time or we run out of uh, uh, things that bother us when we look at the code. So, um, some final thoughts. Um, first off, work with the tools. The tools are there to help you, not to hinder you. But uh, there is a fair amount of developers that say, no, my way or the highway, you know? Uh, I want to do things exactly my way. Well, then you go and make your own private open source projects. We are a large uh, uh, distributed open source project. We need something that works with many people. We cannot handle each and every developer particular uh, preferences. As I said before with the code formatter, something that we can tolerate, not something that we like. And, uh, and so, these tools will help you to test many platforms, many databases, many uh, integrations. Use them rather than, you know, fighting with them. Um, when doing pull requests, I suggest having a clear checklist of what you want for a pull request to be merged into your project. This is the one that we have for GeoTools and GeoServer. So, read the contribution guidelines, uh, the, the CLA, um, that we target first the, the development branch and then we backport, that's how we work. But then also that we, uh, we have a unit test that the QA build passes, that if you make any changes to the user interface and so on, there is documentation updated because we don't have people writing documentation for us. The developers must do it and so on. And we have a commit message in a particular way, formatted in a particular way because it, it helps us to cross-reference between issue tracker, comments, and so on, and, and so on. So these rules are the same for everyone, so they are at least fair. Some people just get mad when they see it, and uh, it's life. If nothing else works, have a stale bot. So people sometimes barge in they delete the checklist completely. They don't care, they don't want it. So it's gone from the pull request, and they do that. And uh, we tell them, no, please put back the checklist, please add the unit test, please uh, update the documentation. And maybe they, they don't do it. Well, we, have a, we, we don't want to, to fight or chase after them. There is a stale bot. If the pull request goes stale for six months, you can configure it to whatever time you want this bot will just close it. It gives you a warning, I'm about to close this pull request because it's gone stale. After two weeks, it's closed. And it's live. We don't, you don't want to have old pull requests accumulating that are three years old, that are uh, hopelessly outdated and so on. It's just not gonna work. And this is it. Thank you. <laughs>